So I'm Lise, and today I'm going to speak a little bit about dance, a little bit about rehabilitation science, which is a form of applied neuroscience. And specifically, I'll be talking about bridging the disciplines. So if we get this up. Hopefully you've come away from the talk with the sense that the body knows more than we think. So I'll start by asking, take a look at this image and if you just think about what it means to you, what it says to you, uh, what it is. Maybe you look at it and think art. I look at this and I think data. I also look at this and think movement recovery because I know how this image was made. So I'm a dancer. I'm a rehabilitation scientist, and this is what I do. I embed the arts to help promote movement when movement is the medicine. Two pictures of my friends Aaron and Brad. Brad is on the left. He's got a movement sensor, motion sensor. It's actually a gyroscopic mouse. It's attached to his left upper leg, his thigh. On the right-hand side, Brad's on top. He's got the motion sensor attached to his torso. On the bottom, Aaron, motion sensor attached to his torso. Essentially, they have to do a lot of movement. Both Aaron and Brad have had spinal cord injuries. In order to stay as good as they can, in addition to trying to get better, they've got to move. The movement is the medicine. So what I do is try to give them something to look at so that the movement is more engaging and they can do more of it with a sense of flow. I use interactive arts technology. As they move, as long as they have that motion sensor on them, they can see their movement occurring on the screen as well. There are two important things I wanted to point out about the design of this. It can't just be any, any old dots on the screen. It has to be some aesthetic design to it. This is essentially what it is. It's aesthetically enhanced biofeedback. So the first is that, it turned out tactical immersion was really important. Tactical immersion is a, is a term from game theory, and essentially it means that when the person moves, when you sense movement internally, you want to see the screen update immediately. You want to see the impact of your action on the world. You don't want to feel a delay there. That's tactical immersion. The second element that turned out to be kind of important with this was giving a sense of uh, perspective within the screen. So we would call that aesthetic immersion. Arts really does this very well. We have all sorts of techniques for creating perspective, for creating a third dimension out of a two-dimensional space. In this particular case, with the embedded arts images, I did something really simple. I used a pseudo-random, uh, 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 I pseudo-randomly varied the size of the dots that are automatically appearing on the screen to get bigger and smaller so that it looked like the dots were coming out and receding into the screen. Very simple solutions, nothing over-engineered, but it turns out it was pretty effective. Now, I want to move on to three insights that I've gained from bridging the disciplines. So I'm actually the first person with an MFA to be hired as faculty in the Medical Center at Ohio State. Um, there have been a lot of first time scenarios for me in that whole situation. And uh, there have been a lot of insights gained. I think I've boiled them down to three that I really hope that I can convey. The first, incredibly powerful insight. Who knows if you ever thought of it yourself? Seriously, no one likes to be told what to do. No one. People hate being told what to do. I have a picture here of my two children, five and three. And hopefully anybody in the audience with kids or kids as friends or who remembers being a kid remembers you didn't like being told what to do. Now the thing is, as we get older, we learn to manage that feeling, but it never really goes away. We never really like being told what to do. Turns out there's quite a bit of neuroscience behind that. When it comes to learning how to move, how to impact the world with your forces, open a doorknob. Balance, walk, pat your dog, 
hug your grandparents. No one can teach you how to navigate that force from the outside. Your body has to figure it out for itself. We call that implicit learning. The classic example of implicit learning is riding a bike. When you learned to ride a bike, did someone tell you, oh yeah, you just, ex you just extend one hip and you flex the other hip and then you reciprocate, keep changing. <laughs> you got on the bike, you gave it a try, trial and error, you let your body figure it out for itself. That's the way movement is learned. So when you're relearning movement after a central nervous system or a peripheral nervous system injury, that has to happen. Dance does a really good job at implicit learning. If you think about it, dance teaches people to move well, to navigate force well, without them having to be told explicitly what to do all the time. So we use a couple of, of techniques to um, make sure that our instructional mode is an implicit learning mode. And we're trying to use those techniques in rehabilitation. One of the techniques is improvisation, like jazz improvisation, dance improvisation. Another of the, uh, the implicit learning techniques that we use in dance a lot is analogy learning. So it's when you learn by imagery. For instance, one of the foundational things you have to learn for dance is to turn out. Technically, that's externally rotating at the hips. In ballet, everything you do requires turnout. You can't move in a ballet way without turnout. But we don't use those terms to train people. We don't say externally rotate your hips. No, we use images. So everybody gets a different image. The image that I learned with, somebody told me, pretend that your legs are two barbershop poles rotating against each other. So when I dance in the ballet style, I'm dancing on top of two barbershop poles. I'm using implicit learning. Implicit learning is a way to learn how to move in new ways without anyone having to tell you exactly how to do it. Second profound insight. Our bodies know more than we think. So I don't mean this in a mind over manner kind of way. So I don't mean that if we just think hard about things that we'll be able to do them. The opposite. We need to take our brains out of the loop. The swimmer didn't learn to swim by thinking through it or being told how to do it. She got in the water and she, her body figured it out for herself. And that's a primary form of intelligence that we don't use enough. In rehabilitation, it becomes critical. In the last 40 years, we have discovered a phenomenon that we call neuroplasticity or neural remodeling. So, Turns out, we only use like 10% of the neurons in our body, okay? That gives us 90% to work with. We have a redundant system. What we have to do is figure out when some neurons get severed, how do we tell the body, oh, can't you just use this other neuron? The way that we tell the body to do that, the way that we induce neuroplasticity or rerouting of neurons is through sensation. We move the body, and we let the body sense things. So Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation has funded the Neuro Recovery Network. They're having tremendous success with spinal cord injury rehabilitation. It doesn't work for everybody, but it's extremely promising. They are taking advantage of this principle. People get into a body weight support harness, so they're supported, and therapists move their legs in a walking motion. And it's, it's really, truly like, the muscles and the spinal cords say like, didn't I used to be able to do this? This was like totally awesome when I could do it. Let me see if I can figure this out again. And the body rewires. Our bodies know more than we think, and we're taking advantage of that in neurorehabilitation. Point number three, you can bridge the disciplines. So it can be really hard to just do one discipline or to silo yourself. So why would you? I think probably a lot of people in this audience are already bridging the disciplines. I'd like to end with two points. One is sort of a synthesis of the mantras that I use to uh, start something new, bridging the disciplines. And one is for people who are already engaged in doing this. So we have these friends. They're friends of my, my sons. Uh, and they have these house rules. We call them Roshan's rules, because that's my son Casey, it's his friend. 
They've synthesized these rules down. It's a little bit like that, uh, everything you need to learn, you learn in kindergarten. I use these rules on a regular basis. Be respectful, be responsible, be kind, and have fun. For anyone looking to do something new, bridge the disciplines or something else, I would suggest start with those four rules, see what happens. For people who are already in this space, I really just have one word, and I'll end with that. Persevere. Thank you.